Okay, uh, welcome to this week's um, book club on um, outstanding user interfaces with Shiny. Um, we are working through the second half of chapter 12, which is about using kind of um, non-traditional elements on a web page to provide input values for a, a, a Shiny app. Uh, so things other than like, you know, text input boxes and stuff like that. Um, and then we're going to have a look at chapter 13, which is about the life cycle of shiny input elements. Um, so these are, um, so that is when the element, when the bindings are defined when they're bound to shiny when they are um when elements corresponding to each binding are created and you know how data is sent to and from them um hello everyone um uh yeah we've got a few weeks left in the the, the this javascript section of the book um two more um, I think someone's already claimed the shiny events uh, chapter. Might be mistaken. And then we've got a few more sections of the book on uh, bootstrap and workflow and some uh, a section on mobile development and using things like the React framework within shiny. Um, I've got to admit the chapter 12, which we discussed last week, and the, the second half of it, I have I've found pretty challenging. Um, okay, so uh, so I don't actually I haven't actually created any notes for this week. Um, but um, oh god, where are we? Secondary inputs. So um, the first thing we're going to do is um, diff kind of distinguish between primary and secondary inputs. Where are we? 12, 2. There. Um, so if we take... No, that's not right. I just want the text. Right, um, so a text input element in Shiny will um, create a collection of HTML elements nested within a, a div. So this will, um, so you've got an element in here that's the one that's kind of most important here and it's called input, uh, sorry, the element type is input. Um, it has its own ID and sorry, not the element type. That's the 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 type here is the the type of data that a user would enter into this input element. It's an input element, right? Um, and obviously it has a, a class and some currently stored value. That's a primary input as as far as Shiny is concerned. Uh, well, as far as the web's concerned, really. But you can actually use other UI elements, other HTML elements to provide input to a web application. Um, so for Shiny, you can use elements that, that don't have this input um, flag on them. Um, and take values from those elements, um, update those elements and, um, and you know, do, do other things with them that, that, that you would do if like a user was entering input into an input element. Um, first thing, the first example in this, there's two, there's, there's two sort of gradually more difficult examples of creating a box in 
um, um, shiny. So um, the first thing we're going to look at is um, if I take that there. So this this is code to create um, an element uh, using Shiny dashboard that, that that kind of adds a box to a um, to a web page. So the 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 box might have title and some footer text and things like that. You can change the color and the size and things of of the box, but they would ultimately look like where's the figure this here. Um, so you've got um, some different boxes in here. I think there's, um, yeah, if we go to the example, um, this here is a, a box element. If we inspect that, where is it? No, right, the whole thing here. So it's the the little colored bit on the left hand side and the content as well is a box element right so you can see that one you can also see um this one da, 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 is an info box as well um and these the example here has come from a a, a framework called admin LTE, which I don't know a great deal about, but they do discuss in this um, chapter. So what we're going to try and do is use the, um, is there a way to collapse these boxes? I thought that was kind of the purpose of this section. Um, what we're going to try and do is use these boxes as input elements and the, the the only thing that they're going to send back to the shiny back end is whether they're open or closed whether they're like expanded or collapse um and how do we do that so you start off with the code for oh, sorry you start off with the code for a box in shiny dashboard which looks like this um decide what the class of the box should be um some stuff to define what the style should be and then da, 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 you format in the title and you are returning a div element um so you are what is it now? Div class equals blah 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 class equals box class. So that would typically be um, say a collapsed box or a box dash solid class. This is the bit of code that we're going to change here. So that's the kind of HTML content. Um, and the way that they change it here is they change it into a, a tag list which contains the dependencies um which are a bit of javascript code that you're gonna that, that, that gets written in the in an appropriate package and then you have these div elements so again you've got the class just like in here uh you've got uh, a div defining the ID and the class and then any content that might you might want to add to that box. So anything here that's passed in with the supposedly three dots um, will get passed in here. So you might add you know the text that goes in the right hand side here and stuff like that. Um, The um, the dependencies are all written up in the the, the package for this book. Um, so in here in the box binding .js file for this um, GitHub um, repository. Um, 
I'll get that open. Um, so that will be in in slash input system. And then box binding dot js. Is it in there? Box binding dot js. Oh no, it will be um, input bindings here. Box binding dot js. So the code that we're working towards looks like this. Um, and last week we were talking. We were we were defining. Um, a, a more typical input element, um, one that um, I can't actually remember what the example was now, um, but it, you know, it would it would have had the input element tag at the start of the, the the HTML element, and you'd either enter some text or enter some numbers into it or something. Um, in order to define an input element in 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 Shiny, you need to define a few different methods find, get value, set value. And these are um, so that you can find elements on the page that are of, uh, that, that are boxes. Um, a way to get any of the values that are stored within those boxes and set any values that's stored within them. Um, to receive values from Shiny and then I can't exactly remember what subscribe was, but we discussed it last week as well. Um, I think that might be how you send data back to Shiny uh, after various events. Okay. Um, okay, so. So um, what we want to do is we want to take that box element and make it something that we can expand and collapse. Um, and um, in order to um, do that, we need to define a function that will get called in the server side of a Shiny app. And when it gets called with a particular ID, it will tell a box with that ID either collapse or expand, something like that anyway. Um, so that's the example we've just looked. Right, okay, so there should be a way to collapse these, but I can't see it. Maybe it's not in, in um, so we're going to um, define a the the JavaScript code now. So um, yeah, so we started off with the this is an R function here for defining the um, user interface code for for the box. Um, and what's the box class again? I think that's the same. And um, we have to modify so the difference is the difference is that the difference is that in this box here, there's no ID unless explicitly set by the caller. Um, so a box created this way would have pro would probably have no identifier, which means that it's more difficult to update the values for a specific box and, and things like that. Whereas here we're explicitly adding a, an ID um, parameter to the to the function which gets passed along and, and passed on to the box. Um, yeah, so, right, so 
see um, yeah so we're now kind of defining those methods that we need to um, to find all the boxes on the page that's that one so we're going to find anything with a class of box which um, Um, then uh, for a given box element, define how to uh, determine whether or not that box is collapsed. Um, so uh, da, 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 da. what happens when you collapse one of these box elements is that it acquires the class collapse-box. And you can then return an object containing that Boolean value, whether whether or not the element you're looking at is a collapsed box element. Um, similarly, you can set the value. And setting the value, if Shiny sends a message over that's captured by receive message, then receive message will send a uh, method call over to set value, which will cause it to toggle whether the box is collapsed or uncollapsed. Um, and um, yeah, so receive message basically, this is data that you might acquire it from a shiny message, um, you know, it, it, with like. If you sent send custom message from Shiny to the front end, um, it would be um, mapped to the appropriate element that you're trying to refer to by Shiny, and then you would be able to change, you know, set the value for that element, which would mean for us that you would be toggling whether or not the 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 boxes expanded or closed. Um, yeah, the final thing that they define here is um, the events that the box will respond to. So here, they, they make a, bit, a, a little bit of, um, there's a little bit of discussion about um, the the kind of timing lags between clicking on a box and it collapsing and and, and or on collapsing. So there's like um, the the box itself takes half a second to collapse by default. Um, and if you send an event, uh, sorry, and in response to collapsing the box in response to the event that causes that box to collapse if you don't wait for a few milliseconds it's possible you'll set, be sending back to shiny that um, the box is collapsed when it isn't if you've tried to expand a collapsed box or that the box is uncollapsed when it isn't um, so you have to ensure that like the app is in the correct state before you send a message back to Shiny. Um, anyway, this is a lot of this is like really, really kind of low level kind of concerns. What, what we're doing is exactly the same as we did last week with the input bindings that we defined um, for um, for you know, a, a primary input. So what we did was, uh, what was it again? It was an action button that we basically defined. Um, yeah, so, um, so you're defining the same methods. You're defining a HTML function within R as well. And you're defining a way to map the 
JavaScript file in your package, uh, ensure that the JavaScript file in your package can be seen as a dependency by your app when it's running on someone's browser. Um, I don't think we should talk about the um, the whole code. We've got the whole code, and um, there is an example for running this. Okay, so what we're going to do is I'm going to run this, and copy it over into our studio. You might find that I don't have many of the packages <laughs> required in here today. Um, uh, yeah, I only installed Shiny about half an hour ago. So, um, right, um, that might that might take a minute. Um, uh, yes. Um, so um, there are other packages, other R packages that use a similar um, technique where you are taking a non-traditional HTML element on a page and using it as if it's an input to uh, a Shiny app. So, you know, they can um, store a little bit of state about um, uh, what data is stored in them or whether they are um, highlighted or, or something like that. And that kind of information you can send back to Shiny. Um, so yes, this thing that you uses Bootstrap for um, for making dashboards has a similar thing that creates uh, box elements that can be used to. Uh, um, right, did that load? Yeah, right. Okay. So this is the box here. Trying to remember how to ah toggle it. So there's a button here that causes the box to be collapsed, and what that should do is make the whole of this collapse like that, and then you can view it. If we inspect this, uh, oh sorry, I'm doing this in the R Studio browser, which is always difficult for viewing things, but. Um, that there is box body id equals my box class equals box and it has shiny bound input as an, an additional class now if we collapse that then it acquires the collapsed box class as well and in response to collapsing that box, the app is sending whether or not it's collapsed to Shiny. So, um, so you're clicking on that toggle box button. It sends information to the Shiny server function. That information is passed around in the server function and says, hey, can you collapse the box that the user has is referring to here, which sends some code back to the front end, the appropriate box element is found and is um, asked to toggle itself so that it's collapsed. And when it's collapsed, it's then sending some information back to Shiny to indicate that it's collapsed. So although it feels like your box is really an output because it's like a traditional shiny input, this, this, this action button here that toggles whether or not it's visible. When it's visible, it sends a message to the shiny server to say, I'm visible at the moment. When it's invisible, it sends a message to the shiny server. So it's, it is actually functioning as an input. And that kind of stuff isn't very well supported in shiny, the, you know, the shiny standalone package. Um, so that's that. Um, 
let's get the book back up. Now, there's a further example in here, which I don't I don't think we've got time to go over because it's it's quite in it, it it's it's very involved um and the um the the problem that they're trying to address here is um in a traditional shiny app if you wanted to um make a box disappear and reappear and things in response to user input you might have to use a render ui call and the problem with render ui is it can cause it can it means that the virtually the whole of your app has to be reconstructed um so it's quite an inefficient way of um updating an app um and they they go through some uh, code to, to to explain how they did that and how they can change the color of the app and, and things like that without having to remove the box, change the color in the input to a HTML generating function, and then um, render the new box. So rather than like rendering the new box, you can just tell a box that already exists in the front end change from green to red. Um, I'm, so I'm not going to go through that. The the example is quite complicated, to be honest. Um, and there's a, a little cartoon towards the bottom that um, explains how they do this. So like um, your user is selecting a property or a size or something like that that's passed uh, into into shiny um and that those con sort of configuration properties are then sent from shiny to a uh, a box element and they tell the relevant box element to change the color property from one value to another or the width property from one value to another um yeah so it's quite involved um you're sending a message from shiny to that that's handled by the receive message um method in the box binding that they create um when that receive message is 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 taken it sends a message back to shiny that tells it you know things like whether it's collapsed and what color it currently is and things like that um but um there isn't many exercises in this book and um there is some exercises to extend upon that um example i, I haven't done them to, to be honest but i, I I found the chapter quite hard going and, and like um to to get to this point was was quite a challenge. Um sections twelve three and twelve four I might come back to after chapter thirteen if that's all right, because um they are there's they they're quite short sections anyway and um oh yeah, I'll come back to them. So Chapter 13 is about input life cycles. Um, and it's again, it's I think in the printed book, it's only like four or five pages. One of one of the pages is like a full page cartoon as well. Um, so what actually happens when your shiny app starts and what happens when it closes down and what happens when a user event occurs be that like you know entering some values or something like that uh the um the things that are touched on in this chapter um so the first thing that happens when your shiny app starts as far as the front end's concerned um is that a 
a function of a method called init shiny runs. And what that does, we can have a look at it, but it's like, I mean, this is the JavaScript version of it. And that's kind of out of date now because shiny is now written in TypeScript. So the reason it's pulled out this particular um, um, blob that, you know, git commit uh, version of, of, of the file is that it, it's all written in TypeScript now, which would be a second layer of difficulty in the book if we were to write TypeScript instead of JavaScript, I think. Um, so this function here, what it does, um, it defines a new Shiny app and then, uh, so yeah, I should say this is JavaScript code. Um, at the end, what happens? You, oh, it's quite a long function actually. Um, yeah, so effectively, oh, sorry, I'll go back to the book. What happens is your input bindings and your output bindings are defined and those are the things that kind of allow you to define specific elements that are of a particular type of input or a particular type of output then any inputs um, uh, will be defined using initialize inputs so that what that will do is it will put like default values into input elements and then kind of create the position on the page for those uh, input elements, I think. Um, and then, um, yeah, so, and then the, the front end will initialize a WebSocket connection and send some values from um, the client's machine through that WebSocket to this shiny server uh, side. So what happens in the start, your user types in the HTTP, you know, the HTTP, blah, 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 to your app. That will then cause the server to send some um, uh, code over that will get um, handled by the user's browser. Along with that code is something that causes the shiny JavaScript object to be initiated and this init shiny method to run on the client's machine. Um, um, the, the input bindings, so input bindings, like I was saying, there's like, there's one for each box. There's, there's one input binding for all the box elements in your app. There's one input binding for all the text input elements in your app. Um, and those input bindings are uh, stuck into something called a binding registry. Um, and um, so that binding registry, it stores all the different types of class that are input bindings for a shiny app. Some of those input bindings won't have a corresponding element. So what happens next is for each of those input input bindings, you run the find method and find for a given input binding will find, say for like the box input binding, it will find all boxes on the page. Um, uh, if there's no element on the page corresponding to a particular binding element that uh, bind input binding then nothing really can be done but um, otherwise you'll find that there are you know a handful of um, text inputs some action buttons some um, boxes and things like that um, and for each of those elements um, there's a few different steps that happen. So you run this get ID thing, get type, get value, and then subscribe. And what that does is it kind of takes the default values 
for those inputs, sorry, subscribe that is, takes the default values for those elements and sends them back to the shiny server side so that the, the you know, the shiny input dollar X values are all populated with their um, initial values. That's my understanding at least. Um, then, um, shiny input binding is then added. So if you remember when we looked at this app, um, inspect element on that. Oh, oh God, something invalid's happened. Shiny bound input. Is that the thing that I was looking at? Oh no, it's not, sorry. Um, the data attribute shiny input binding. Sorry, I thought that was um, shiny shiny input binding. Maybe it's not added because it's an alert. Sorry, I'll find it. Oh, you can just um, shiny. Where's the book again? Shiny dash input binding. Yeah, sorry, there wasn't anything by that class. Uh, oh God, I was looking for a class. It should be a data attribute anyway. Um, yeah, I'll move on from this because it's obviously not being very successful. Um, right. Um, the um, yeah. So once you've um, initiated the, the kind of um, the structure of the, the app on the user's browser um, and you found all the elements for all the different types of inputs and um, sent their initial values over to the shiny server side, um, you then um, you then add this data attribute to each of those elements uh, to show to indicate that that is a um, input binding for shiny um yeah um so the these are like initial steps that you need to do before any of the kind of reactive logic can go on in the server side of a shiny app um da -da -da -da, the bounded object so the bound input object is oh that's different from the binding registry um yes so there's a bound inputs object which is held by shiny which is a, something you can use to like iterate over all the the input elements on a on, in an app um and a shiny bound right that's a um that's kind of like uh, an an event that is triggered on a shiny app. So if we actually look at the, um, if I open it in the browser, that might be better. Inspect. So what happens normally is this. Oh, that's weird. Sorry, I thought the. Oh, that was a. I thought it was a shiny bound thing visible on. Um, triggered on the client. That's funny. I thought it. I stopped the one. I thought it showed up here that we were in the state where shiny is bound to all its elements. Um. Anyway. Um, yes, for once all that initialization is done, um, there's a, an event triggered on the, the client that tells it that all of the elements are bound to their inputs. And then eventually, you know, if the user uh, enters some text or something, something will become unbound and then new data will be transferred over. Reactions will happen and everything will be sent back. 
and then it will get back into this state where everything's bound up again. Um, I, that's my understanding, at least. So this is like a, a kind of a bit of stateful data stored in the the browser side that indicates whether the app is in a um, um, a kind of stable position. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, all the initial values. Da, da, da. So yeah, so we've got um, init shiny gets called, the inputs get bound. Um, we uh, get all the different input bindings defined by the, the, the dependencies of Shiny and bind all of their elements um, into this, uh, what is it now, initial, into bound inputs. Um, all the initial values get stored by a JavaScript object as well. And then you connect to the Shiny app on the server side and um, send those values across the WebSocket to, for, for the server side to work with. Um, uh, so this is talking about the um, shiny object so in um, in a in an app you can actually uh, which one is it now console you can do shiny and that will this is an object that's accessible um, at the top level of your JavaScript code. So it's not like um, modularized away so that you can't work with it. Um, the input bindings here, so if we have a look at them, there's um, input bindings for um, box input, which is the thing here, for an action button here. Um, and then if we actually look at the um, what is it now? Bindings. There's quite a lot of things bound to values. Um, right, anyway. So there's a, a bunch of different um, values stored in that shiny object. Um, and there's methods that you can call upon it and things like that. Um, so things that are stored within that have some pretty typical names. So input values are the, 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 the values that are stored in the input elements. And they correspond to the variables stored in your input dollar um, variables in the server side of a Shiny app. Um, let's run the example below and open the HTML X. Inspector. Okay, let's do that then. If I stop that, um, where are we? Okay, and that open and that, so it's easier to debug, but harder to um, right. So what have we got here? Right. So we've got this app, you've got a number of observations slider, and then um, if you modif if you move that slider, you will sample some normal, you know, standard normal variables. Um, so currently we've got 500 of them presented as a histogram. If I bring it down to something really low, it gets a bit more jagged because it's, you know, um, a, a, a worse approximation to a normal distribution. Um, and if I increase the observations to a huge number, then you get a pretty smooth curve. Um, 
what's happening here is the the value bound by this element is getting sent over as input dollar obs um that's then used to you know define the sample of numbers and the histogram produced um and then something's bound to this other variable which is kind of plotted out by by shiny we're not really talking about outputs too much here but um so how to access shiny's initial input value with shiny shiny app right so if we inspect down to the bottom console so if we do shiny um and shiny shiny um obs so obs presumably for observed is this slider inputs um, variable name um, and is used to but you can see that like you can access the value associated with that input element using JavaScript directly in the console and it's by working with this um, shiny object that you end that you end up passing data back and forth between the um the 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 browser well from the browser to the server um we're only interested in this line of objects so we can actually uh, so if we look at initial So it starts with a value of 500, which corresponds to the um, value equals 500 that we had when we defined our kind of static HTML code um, in the user interface side of the, the app. Um, should I go on to updating your input? Um, I'm, not entirely certain I can do that in five minutes. Um, anyway, um, so that the purpose of this chapter was to give you an outline of kind of the processes that are, are in place in um, the that that happen in the browser before any values are sent to the server side of the the, the, the shiny app. So initially, you get a bunch of data and some HTML comes over from the server and is kind of rendered in the user's browser with a bunch of initial values and things like that. Once all those initial values and all the elements have been found and, and, and things, um, the app enters a state where um, it, it, it knows that all its kind of input elements are now bound. So it should be in a kind of fixed and steady state so it can send those initial values over to the shiny server side um, to do any reactive updating type stuff um yeah um da, 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 da. there was something in here though that i found quite interesting was that i think the the values get sent over in batch rather than um one by one um which makes sense from a kind of efficiency perspective i guess um yeah anyway it's a it's a very interesting chapter um but i, I to be honest I, I i'm pushing up against the time limit to discuss the the rest of the the content um yeah i don't know does anyone have any questions i know it's no one really kind of posted anything in the chat or anything um Uh, I think I just echo like that you said these couple of chapters have been pretty tough. Um mm. but in a good way, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
cool yeah um so um anyway so that's um all i'm going to say this week about input uh, elements so last week we talked about you know defining shiny inputs uh, custom inputs and stuff and also how the ones used in shiny are used um next week we're going to be talking about events which are um more uh actually quite interesting so this is like how you know the the state that the app is in at the at, at any given time there'll be an event like you know if if an input gets changed or something like that that, that gets sent from one side to the other i believe someone's put their name down to do this um I, i'm not entirely certain who it was but i'll, I'll check anyway um yes so um yes so we'll be talking about events um and um yeah brilliant um cool uh thanks everyone for coming along today um and um i look forward to seeing you all next week um